One of Bitcoin's key traits is its programmability. But a lot of folks say, well, Bitcoin's not all that programmable. Uh, its scripting language is very limited, etc. And so today we're going to look at one of the very interesting building blocks of that programmability that is extending what we can do with Bitcoin. And that is discrete log contracts. Let's jump in. Welcome back to another video. My name is Ian Major. I'm an entrepreneur at Bitcoin Pleb, an all around raging capitalist. And I've been waiting to do a video on discrete log contracts. I think this will likely be the first of several videos. And for those who have been watching the channel for some time, know that I have a whole playlist on different ways in which folks are trying to add more programmability to Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin script is purposefully simple. You know, we want the base settlement layer that is Bitcoin to be purposefully simple. Uh, this minimizes attack surface. It makes it super calcified and robust and is therefore the most secure immutable blockchain in existence. And it's not even close. But then the question is, how can we extend the usefulness of Bitcoin through additional layers, either on top of Bitcoin or, you know, adjacent to it or connected to it in some way? And so discrete log contracts is quite a dated uh, concept that has really become a lot more practical with taproot that happened last year. And so today we're going to explore what are discrete log contracts, how do they work, what are some of the use cases they support. So you are not going to want to miss a thing. For those returning to the channel, welcome back, my friends, as always. It is a pleasure to have you. And for those new to the channel, I welcome you as well. If you like this type of content, I invite you to consider subscribing and join us in our growing merry gang in cyberspace. I cover all manner of Bitcoin related content, including a whole slew of tutorials and how to's on acquiring Bitcoin, securing your Bitcoin, privacy best practices, running your own node, uh, news analysis, as well as kind of thought pieces like this that delve into some of the different technologies uh, within the Bitcoin world. And so if any of that sounds good, I invite you to come along for the journey. But with all that out of the way, let's dive into the meat for today and talk a little bit about the motivation behind DLCs, and then we'll get into how they work. So the concept of DLCs goes quite a ways back, um, and this comes from Taj Dreja, who, as it happened, was one of the co-authors of the Lightning Network white paper. And the motivation behind this is to enable trust-minimized sort of off-chain contracts that help solve for some of the potential issues we see with broader smart contract platforms, you know, like Ethereum, and of course there are many. And those include things like potentially high fees, right? When you try and cram all this functionality on the same sort of uh, base layer, which, you know, Ethereum did and is facing, you know, high fees as a result. And of course, that's why there are uh, layer two scaling efforts like Polygon and others. Uh, but then you also have a lot of privacy related considerations, right? Smart contracts are essentially just computer programs on a blockchain. So the contract itself is visible, uh, as well as the interactions of users with that contract. And that leaves a lot to be desired from a privacy standpoint. And so DLCs, as we will discuss, essentially happen off chain. And so the only on-chain footprint of a DLC is kind of the initial funding and then uh, ultimately the execution of those funds for whatever it is that the contract is. In its simplest form, think of two users coming in, uh, placing a bet on some future outcome, right? And it could be anything. And so what happens is these two participants come uh, together, they put up funds into what is essentially a multi-state contract. And then there is what's called an oracle, which is broadcasting information about a particular event outcome. So in this you know, simple coin flip case, right, you would have an oracle that would be able to broadcast whether the coin flip was heads or tails. And depending on that, the payout would execute accordingly. So another way to say that is think of DLCs as a special kind of Bitcoin transaction where multiple parties lock funds within a multi-sig and then unlock those funds through a signature from an oracle. And as we will discuss, all of this process has become a lot more practical and efficient through Schnorr signatures, which we got as part of the Taproot upgrade to Bitcoin last year. Uh, I've done a whole video on that if you are curious to check that out. So there are a lot of different use cases here. You know, you could think of all sorts of different betting markets, right, where, you know, participants are betting on the outcome of some 
event or some occurrence happening in the real world. This also paves a way for a lot of different financial derivatives, things like options, things like uh, forwards, futures, all these sorts of contracts, which uh, a lot of which can be boiled down to, hey, you know, the price of this asset will be worth more than this in this specified time in the future, right? And if you have a oracle that can communicate that information, then you have the basis for a DLC. So let's talk in more detail about how this actually works. As we can see in this handy diagram, things get started by the construction of a funding transaction to create, in this case, a two of two multi-sig. So let's say that there are two participants, Alice and Bob, represented by A and B, uh, and let's say they're each putting in one Bitcoin into this funding transaction. And let's say that they are betting on whether the price of Bitcoin in the next 24 hours is going to moon or it is going to crash. And this dividing line in the middle is really important. This, going back to the prior diagram, this separates what the footprint is on chain versus what is it that's happening off chain. So we start constructing that funding transaction and then we're also able to compute and by we, I mean your wallet is doing this. Uh, we're able to compute public keys associated with each of the possible event outcomes. And these are derived from the Schnorr signatures that the Oracle might broadcast. Okay, so, you know, in, the, in our case, there's just two outcomes, moon or crash. And so there would be two public keys that we can derive based on the potential signature that the Oracle might broadcast depending on which of those outcomes actually happens. Now that we have those ingredients, we can also form what are called contract execution transactions or CETs. And these specify how the funding transaction outputs would get dispersed depending on the event outcome. How this actually works is each party has what's called an adapter signature, which can be decrypted once the Oracle actually publishes a signature. I'm not going to go into like the gory kind of math behind all these steps, uh, but I would encourage you to check out this excellent, excellent blog series from Sherdbits, which is kind of the leading name behind uh, Bitcoin DLCs. And they have a lot of really useful, not just kind of DLC context, but some of the context behind the cryptography of, you know, public key derivation and all this sort of stuff. Uh, I've also done a whole video, by the way, on how a lot of that works. So check that out too if you are so curious. All right, so we've computed the public keys associated with those different event outcomes. We have formed the contract execution transactions, and now the funding transaction can be published to the blockchain. And then in our case here, again, it's you know 24 hours, does the price of Bitcoin go up or down? It's obviously a very quantifiable event, and whatever Oracle we're using to convey that information would convey that information and the appropriate CET would execute accordingly. And so this is pretty cool. What just happened is that two parties were able to form a very simple contract. It didn't reveal anything about the contract uh, to the public, right? None of the context of moon or crash or any of that was discernible on the public blockchain that is Bitcoin. All that you can see on the public blockchain is the funding transaction and then ultimately the movement of funds once the contract settles. Now, with all that being said, you can probably immediately see uh, some of the considerations we should be aware of, right? There is trust required. You have to be able to have trustworthy oracles. And what's known as the oracle problem is a broad problem. And I think it remains to be seen what the ultimate solution for that is. But you can imagine all sorts of really interesting game theory based structures whereby, you know, you could have different oracles that make themselves known and monetize their services that have some sort of feedback loop that allows them to be punished for conveying inaccurate information or trying to game the system, you know, different things like that, right? Maybe you have a, a platform where different oracles basically put up collateral in an escrow type account. But there are some existing thoughts around mitigating that uh, as that shirt bits piece sort of alludes to. Another logical question you may ask is like, how does this fit in amidst other technologies that are all sort of pushing to expand and extend what Bitcoin can do? And I personally think this uh, scribbled diagram from Munib, who's the founder of Stacks, uh, explains this really well. For those of you who have watched this channel, you may know I am a big fan of Stacks for unlocking native Bitcoin DeFi and other use cases. There's still a ton 
of scrutiny and uh, skepticism from the broader Bitcoin community. And I can totally understand that, uh, but these are often folks who haven't taken the time to learn. Nonetheless, what he outlines here are these different sort of layers, right? And so all the way in the middle are Bitcoin script, right? Like this is native Bitcoin script. And what each of these sort of circles or you know squares represents is kind of the breadth of use case that can be supported. And so as you go to the next level up to off-chain contracts, example DLCs, which we've just discussed, that enables you to do yet more use cases uh, like the ones we were talking about earlier. Taproot, as is written along the right-hand side of this, makes number three and four a lot more tactical and efficient. And it also paves the way for even more use cases in the future. So said another way, with Taproot, I fully expect that we see Four, you know, number four and three here uh, continue to expand outwards. But for now, there are still certainly use cases that require a more kind of global state that couldn't be supported by just things like DLCs. And so the example that Munib uses here are AMMs or automated market makers. And so he has, you know, decidable languages like Clarity, which is the smart contract language behind uh, Stacks as well as turn complete languages like Solidity, uh, which is the smart contract language behind Ethereum. But the point here is DLCs are fantastic, especially given some of those privacy benefits we discussed, as well as the fact that it can help with on-chain fees because some of the contracting complexity is happening off-chain, right? These are great, great features to have, but it's not the ultimate silver bullet for all use cases. So it's pretty early days still. But I think there's some really interesting possibilities with this, especially when you consider the possibility of scaling DLCs through something like lightning payment channels, right? Which share a lot of the same kind of structure and scaffolding that we discussed uh, through the anatomy of, of kind of how DLCs work. So very, very cool stuff. Where I wanna head next is just to point you to a couple of the tools that I think are very interesting related to this topic. And I'm going to do videos in the future with deep dives into each of them. So let's take a look at those next. Uh, the latest release has, if we scroll down, uh, you'll see a number of options now in this finance section, one of which is this Shared Bits wallet, a universal DLC wallet. So this is the wallet that's going to allow you to construct and form not just those funding transactions, but the CETs that are sort of embedded within that. As you can see their call out, you know, this is alpha software, so it is really, really early. I'm definitely gonna play around with this, but I will likely wait a little bit before doing a proper kind of tutorial video on this. But stay tuned, and I just wanted to point this out in case you wanna uh, check this out in the meanwhile. The other really interesting accompaniment to this is something called Crystal Ball. And so this is an app that allows you to become an Oracle. So this is also from Sherdbits, but it allows you to become an Oracle and create uh, Bitcoin bets. This is early alpha release. So again, I will be doing some videos in the future on this, but I just wanted to point this out. While DLCs really have all the technological ingredients required, the interfaces for users are still very much coming up to speed uh, and these are two great examples of that. So with all that, let's go ahead and close today's video out. All right, there you have it. So we talked through DLCs, discrete log contracts. We talked about what they are. So essentially a special type of Bitcoin transaction that forms a multi-sig and unlocks funds through the signature of an oracle. And a lot of this has really been made a lot more practical and efficient through Taproot. A whole slew of different use cases, uh, particularly around financial derivatives, betting markets, uh, you know, prediction markets, and others. But then we also talked about how DLCs compare to broader, fully expressive smart contract solutions such as Stacks. Uh, and of course, there are others. It's gonna be really interesting to see how these different technologies continue to advance and you can bet I will be on top of it all the way. So again, if you're not subscribed, I invite you to do so. But I'm curious to hear what you think. What are your thoughts on DLCs? Leave me a comment down below. But for now, we'll go ahead and leave this here. I hope you found this valuable and useful. If you did, you already know what to do. Smash that like button. And as a reminder, my friends, every sat counts. And until next time, 
I'll see you then. <laughs>